Ancient Israel, uh, the, they called them the Am Haaretz in, in rabbinic times. Am Haaretz were the people of the land, which sounds like a, a nice name, but it's actually a derogatory term in rabbinic literature. But they really were the, the majority of ancient Israelite society were people who were um, subsistence farmers, like living on the land, growing food, um, tithing according to these laws, taking the produce to, uh, to the temple in Jerusalem three times a year a really agrarian indigenous society in ancient Israel. And as we know, 2,000 years went by where we were uh, ex expelled, right? exiled, and lived uh, all over, wandered across the, the earth. Um, and in very, very rarely were Jews ever allowed to own and cultivate land. So as it was the core or the basis or the foundation of life as an ancient people, an ancient indigenous people, for the last 2,000 years, we've been disconnected. We have today, uh, you know, norms of giving tzedakah, right, in the Jewish community that everybody gives, and 10% is a known sort of number that many Jews give 10% of their income. That was based originally on an agricultural uh, tithing system where you gave 10% of your harvest. We settled the land to become farmers, um, and that uh, between kind of being shepherds and kind of the animal husbandry and, and food growers, uh, we were an, it was an agricultural economy and the calendar that that we created and the holidays that we celebrated were all tied to the agricultural cycles and we see this in an interesting way with the calendar so the calendar is both a lunar calendar and a solar calendar our months are done are we, we, we count our months by the s cycles of the moon but if we were a strictly s lunar calendar like the muslim calendar then then the months would float relative to the seasons and the solar year so seven times every 19 years, we add an extra month, the second month of Adar. Um, and, and that's to keep the holidays in line with the seasons. And it says this very explicitly in the Torah. It says that you have to celebrate Pesach, Passover in the springtime. So that's, why, that's where the basis for inserting this extra month comes in. And the rabbis used to, they used to determine whether it would be a leap year, whether we would add an extra month by going out into the field and looking at the barley. And if the barley looked like it was going to be ready to harvest in another month, then they declared it a, a normal year. If the barley was still very small and wasn't going to be ready to harvest, then they added an extra month because they knew that you harvest barley at Pesach. And I don't know how many rabbis there are today who would even know how to do that, how to go out into a field and see barley growing and know uh, what stage it's at in its growth and, and when it would be ready to harvest. I would say in terms of, of calendar, which Shemitah is related to, the Shalosh Raglayim, the pilgrimage festivals, are three anchors in the calendar that are three harvest holidays. Barley, wheat, and then the, the fruits in the fall. And if you think about that, those holidays and those harvest times as the core celebrations of the Jewish people, they also represent the main areas of sustenance for the Jewish people. Barley for the animals, wheat for, for bread, and all the, rest, all the fruits, the tree fruits, and the grapes, and everything for Sukkot. And that is, so we're, it's like the main religious themes and the main sustenance from the land coming through those festivals. And these were the times where the farmers in ancient Israel would take their har harvest, whether it was barley, wheat, or those fruits, and go to Jerusalem and imagine all the farmers from throughout Israel bringing their, their harvest, their first fruits, to the temple and all the biodiversity that was represented there, all the agricultural abundance, the, a, a nation, one nation whole united at the center in Jerusalem with the temple and their, their land bounty. And in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, an agricultural tradition and his, his, history, they would recite when they brought those first fruits to the priest, they would recite sort of a mini history of the Jewish people. The proclamation they would make over first fruits would, and I'm paraphrasing, would be like, my, my father was a wandering Aramean and he went down into Egypt and he was enslaved there and we cried out and God heard our cry and God freed us and we traveled through the desert and now we are free people in our land and here is the, 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 the fruit of the land of my harvest and I bring to you and offer to you God because I know it's not mine. And it's like that process of the harvest and going to Jerusalem is sort of the climax of that whole narrative. And so now, for 2,000 years, we haven't been in Israel, we've been exiled, we don't have that, 
you know, those, those harvest times, you don't have the pilgrimage festivals. So how do we reinvent? How do we continue that narrative when we make the, the, our first fruits? How do we make that real? And, and these Jewish farms that are popping up all over North America um, are really innovating as we speak every season. How do we make a, a, a Bikurim, a first fruit ceremony, a first fruit ritual that's meaningful and relevant to us? How do we make these justice laws relevant to us? How do we actually put them into practice? Um, and so when you talk about Shemitah, stepping back every seventh year to not farm at all, to not plow at all, to only harvest what grows by itself, to forgive all of the debts, right? In the Shemitah year, you're not allowed, to, you're basically not allowed to own food. Um, anything that grows in your field that year is public property. Anyone can come through and harvest it. Even the animals, the wild animals can come through and harvest it. Um, so you're not allowed to profit off of food. It's a year where we take food and we say it's no longer a commodity. It's not something that you buy and sell, but it's something that you share. It's something that you build community around. And find the ways in which that tradition helps us, inspires us, motivates us and compels us to create more just and sustainable food systems. How we produce, distribute and consume food in our Jewish community and in general. And so what we're talking about is a very different economic model than what we see here in the United States. It's one that prioritizes the needs of, the, of all members of the community first and foremost. Um, and so to think about how you might man apply these laws in today's um, kind of contemporary American economic system, yeah, it's a bit of a question. Um, and at the same time, we, 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 we see businesses um, that do this. We see businesses that take 10% of their profits and invest it in community projects or things like that. So um, I certainly think that, it, that it, it is possible, but we're also talking about something that's kind of drastically different than what we're seeing today.